Section 3 of Army Letters from an Officer's Wife, 1871-1888. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Army Letters from an Officer's Wife, 1871-1888 by Francis Rowe. Section 3. Letters from 1872. Part 2. Camp Supply, Indian Territory, May 1872. This place is quite as dreadful as it has been represented to us. There are more troops here than at Fort Lyon, and of course the post is very much larger. There are two troops of colored cavalry, one of white cavalry, and three companies of infantry. The infantry companies that have been stationed here, and which our three companies have come to relieve, will start in the morning for their new station, and will use the transportation that brought us down. Consequently, it was necessary to unload all the things from our wagons early this morning, so they could be turned over to the outgoing troops. I am a little curious to know if there is a second lieutenant who will be so unfortunate as to be allowed only one half of a wagon in which to carry his household goods. Their going will leave vacant a number of officers' quarters. Therefore, there will be no selection of quarters by our officers until tomorrow. Faye is next to the junior, so there will be very little left to select from by the time his turn comes. The quarters are really nothing more than huts, built of vertical logs plastered in between with mud, and the roofs are of poles and mud. Many of the rooms have only sand floors. We dined last evening with Captain and Mrs. Vincent of the Cavalry, and were amazed to find that such wretched buildings could be made so attractive inside. But, of course, they have one of the very best houses on the line, and, as company commander, Captain Vincent can have done about what he wants. And then again, they are but recently married, and all their furnishings are new and handsome. There is one advantage in being with colored troops. One can always have good servants. Mrs. Vincent has an excellent colored soldier cook, and her butler was thoroughly trained as such before he enlisted. It did look so funny, however, to see a black man in a blue uniform. The march down from Fort Dodge was most uncomfortable the first two days. It poured and poured rain, and then poured more rain, until finally everybody and everything was soaked through. I felt so sorry for the men who had to march in the sticky mud. Their shoes filled fast with water, and they were compelled constantly to stop, take them off, and pour out the water. It cleared at last, and the sun shone warm and bright, and then there was another exhibition in camp one afternoon of clothing and bedding drying on guy ropes. All the way down I was on the lookout for Indians, and was laughed at many a time for doing so, too. Every time something unusual was seen in the distance, some bright person would immediately exclaim, Oh, that is only one of Mrs. Ray's Indians. I said very little about what I saw during the last day or two, for I felt that the constant teasing must have become as wearisome to the others as it had to me but I am still positive that I saw the black heads of Indians on the top of ever so many hills we passed. When they wish to see and not be seen, they crawl up a hill on the side farthest from you, but only far enough up to enable them to look over, and in this position they will remain for hours, perfectly motionless, watching your every movement. Unless you notice the hill very carefully, you will never see the black dot on top, for only the eyes and upper part of the head are exposed. I had been told all this many times, also that when in an Indian country to be most watchful when Indians are not to be seen. Camp Supply is certainly in an Indian country, for it is surrounded by Comanches, Apaches, Kiowas, Cheyennes, and Arapahoes, each a hostile tribe except the last. No one can go a rod from the garrison without an escort, and our weekly mail is brought down in a wagon and guarded by a corporal and several privates. Only last week, two couriers, soldiers, who had been sent down with dispatches from Fort Dodge, 
were found dead on the road, both shot in the back, probably without having been given one chance to defend themselves. We are in camp on low land just outside the post, and last night we were almost washed away again by the downpouring rain, and this morning there is mud everywhere, and this is the country that is supposed never to have rain. Mrs. Vincent invited me most cordially to come to her house until we at least know what quarters we were to have, and Captain Vincent came early today to insist upon my going up at once, but I really could not go. We have been in rain and mud so long, I feel that I am in no way fit to go to anyone's house. Besides, it would seem selfish in me to desert Faye, and he, of course, would not leave the company as long as it is intense. We are delighted at finding such charming people as the Vincents at this horrid place. End of letter. Camp Supply, Indian Territory june eighteen seventy two we are in our own house now and almost settled when one has only a few pieces of furniture it does not take long to get them in place it is impossible to make the rooms look homelike and i often find myself wondering where in this world i have wandered to the house is of logs of course and has a pole and dirt roof and was built originally for an officer's mess the dining room is large and very long, a part of which we have partitioned off with a piece of canvas and converted into a storeroom. We had almost to get down on our knees to the quartermaster before he would give us the canvas. He is in the quartermaster's department and is most arrogant, seems to think that every nail and tack is his own personal property and for his exclusive use. Our dining room has a sand floor and almost every night little white toadstools grow up all along the base of the log walls. All of the logs are of cottonwood and have the bark on, and the army of bugs that hide underneath the bark during the day and march upon us at night is to be dreaded about as much as a whole tribe of Indians. I wrote you how everyone laughed at me on the march down, because I was positive I saw heads of Indians on the sand hills so many times. Well, all that has ceased, and the mention of Mrs. Ray's Indians is carefully avoided. There has been sad proof that the Indians were there, also that they were watching us closely and kept near us all the way down from Fort Dodge, hoping for a favorable opportunity to steal the animals. The battalion of the Dash Infantry had made only two days' march from here, and the herders had just turned the horses and mules out to graze when a band of Cheyenne Indians swooped down upon them and stampeded every animal, leaving the companies without even one mule. The poor things are still in camp on the prairie, waiting for something, anything, to move them on. General Phillips is mightily pleased that the Indians did not succeed in getting the animals from his command, and I am pleased that they cannot tease me any more. My ride with Lieutenant Golden, Faye's classmate this morning, was very exciting for a time. We started directly after stable call, which is at six o'clock. Lieutenant Golden rode Dandy, his beautiful thoroughbred, that reminds me so much of Lieutenant Baldwin's Tom, and I rode a troop horse that had never been ridden by a woman before. As soon as he was led up, I noticed that there was much white to be seen in his eyes, and that he was restless and ever pawing the ground. But the orderly said he was not vicious, and he was sure I could ride him. He did not object in the least to my skirt, and we started off in fine style, but before we reached the end of the line, he gave two or three pulls at the bit, and then bolted. My arms are remarkably strong, but they were like a child's against that hard mouth. He turned the corner sharply and carried me along back of the laundress's quarters, where there was a perfect network of clotheslines, and where I fully expected to be swept from the saddle. But I managed to avoid them by putting my head down close to the horse's neck, Indian fashion. He was not a very large horse, 
and lowered himself, of course, by his terrific pace. He went like the wind on and up the hill in front of the guardhouse. There a sentry was walking post, and on his big infantry rifle was a long bayonet, and the poor man, in his desire to do something for me, ran forward and held the gun horizontally right in front of my horse, which caused him to give a fearful lunge to the right and down the hill. How I managed to keep my seat I do not know, and neither do I know how that mad horse kept right side up on that down jump. But it did not seem to disturb him in the least, for he never slackened his speed, and on we went toward the stables, where the cavalry horses were tied to long picket ropes, and close together getting their morning grooming. All this time Lieutenant Golden had not attempted to overtake me, fearing that by doing so he might make matters worse. But when he saw that the horse was running straight for his place on the line, he pushed forward and, grasping my bridle rein, almost pulled the horse on his haunches. He said later that I might have been kicked to death by the troop horses if I had been rushed in among them. We went to the stables, Lieutenant Golden leading my horse, and you can fancy how mortified I was over that performance, and it was really unnecessary, too. Lieutenant Golden, also the sergeant, advised me to dismount and try another horse. But I said no. I would ride that one if I could have a severe bit and my saddle girths tightened. Dismount before Lieutenant Golden, a cavalry officer and Faye's classmate, and all those staring troopers? I, the wife of an infantry officer? Never. It was my first experience with a runaway horse, but I had kept a firm seat all the time. There was some consolation in that thought. Well, to my great relief and comfort, it was discovered that the chin-chain that is on all cavalry bits had been left off, and this had made the curb simply a straight bit and wholly ineffective. The sergeant fastened the chain on, and it was made tight, too, and he tightened the girths and saw that everything was right. And then Lieutenant Golden and I started on our ride the second time. I expected trouble, as the horse was then leaving his stable and companions, but when he commenced to back and shake his head, I let him know that I held a nice stinging whip, and that soon stopped the balking. We had to pass three long picket lines of horses and almost two hundred troopers, every one of whom stared at me with both eyes. It was embarrassing, of course, but I was glad to let the whole line of them see that I was capable of managing my own horse, which was still very frisky. I knew very well, too, that the sergeant's angry roar when he asked, Who bridled this horse? had been heard by many of them. Our ride was very delightful after all its exciting beginning, and we are going again tomorrow morning. I want to let those troopers see that I am not afraid to ride the horse they selected for me. I shall be so glad when Hal is large enough to go with me. He is growing fast, but at present seems to be mostly legs. He is devoted to me, but I regret to say that he and our old soldier cook are not the dearest friends. Findlay is so stupid he cannot appreciate the cunning things the little dog does. Hal is fed mush and milk only until he gets his second teeth, and consequently he is wild about meat. The odor of a broiling beefsteak the other day was more than he could resist. So he managed to get his freedom by slipping his collar over his head and rushing into the kitchen, snatched the sizzling steak, and was out again before Fidley could collect his few wits and get across the room to stop him. The meat was so hot it burned his mouth, and he howled from the pain, but drop it he did not until he was far from the cook. This I consider very plucky in so young a dog. Finley ran after the little hound, yelling and swearing, and I ran after Finley to keep him from beating my dog. Of course, we did not have beefsteak that day, but as I told Fay, it was entirely Finley's fault. He should have kept watch of things, and not made it possible for Hal to kill himself by eating a whole big steak. 
Yesterday, Lieutenant Golden came in to luncheon, and when we went in the dining room, I saw at once that things were wrong, very wrong. A polished table is an unknown luxury down here, but fresh table linen we do endeavor to have. But the cloth on the table yesterday was a sight to behold, with big spots of dirt all along one side and dirt on top. Findlay came in the room just as I reached the table, and I said, Findlay, what has happened here? He gave one look at the cloth where I pointed, and then striking his knuckles together, almost sobbed out, That damn dog, mum! Faye and Lieutenant Golden quickly left the room to avoid hearing any more remarks of that kind, for it was really very dreadful in Findlay to use such language. This left me alone, of course, to pacify the cook, which I found no easy task. Old Findlay had pickled a choice buffalo tongue with much care and secrecy, and had served it for luncheon yesterday as a great surprise and treat. There was the platter on the table, but there could be no doubt of its having been licked clean. Not one tiny piece of tongue could be seen any place. The window was far up, and in vain did I try to convince everyone that a strange dog had come in and stolen the meat, that Hal was quite too small to have reached so far. But Findlay only looked cross, and Fay looked hungry, so I gave that up. Before night, however, there was trouble and a very sick puppy in the house, and once again I thought he would die. And every few minutes that disagreeable old cook would come in and ask about the dog, and say he was afraid he could not get well, always with a grin on his face that was exasperating. Finally I told him that if he had served only part of the tongue as he should have done, the dog would not have been so ill, and we could have had some of it. That settled the matter. He did not come in again. Findlay has served several enlistments and is regarded as an old soldier, and once upon a time he was cook for the colonel of the regiment. Therefore he sometimes forgets himself and becomes aggressive. I do not wonder that Hal dislikes him. And Hal dislikes Indians too, and will often hear their low mumbling and give little growls before I dream that one is near. They have a disagreeable way of coming to the windows and staring in. Sometimes, before you have heard a sound, you will be conscious of an uncomfortable feeling, and looking around, you will discover five or six Indians, large and small, peering at you through the windows, each ugly nose pressed flat against the glass. It is enough to drive one mad. You never know when they are about. Their tread is so stealthy with their moccasined feet. Faye is officer of the guard every third day now. This sounds rather nice, but it means that every third day and night, exactly twenty-four hours, he has to spend at the guard house, excepting when making the rounds, that is, visiting sentries on post, and is permitted to come to the house just long enough to eat three hurried meals. This is doing duty and would be all right if there were not a daily mingling of white and colored troops, which often brings a colored sergeant over a white corporal and privates. But the most unpleasant part for the officer of the guard is that the partition in between the officer's room and guard room is of logs, unchinked and very open, and the weather is very hot, and the bugs which keep us all in perpetual warfare in our houses have full sway there, going from one room to the other. The officers say that the Negroes make good soldiers and fight like fiends. They certainly manage to stick on their horses like monkeys. The Indians call them buffalo soldiers, because their woolly heads are so much like the matted cushion that is between the horns of the buffalo. We had letters from dear old Fort Lyon yesterday, and the news about Lieutenant Baldwin is not encouraging. He is not improving, and Dr. Wilder is most anxious about him. But a man as big and strong as he was must certainly get well in time. End of letter. Camp Supply, Indian Territory, June 1872 
It seems as if I had to write constantly of unpleasant occurrences. But what else can I do since unpleasant occurrences are ever coming along? This time I must tell you that Faye has been turned out of quarters, ranked out, as it is spoken of in the Army. But it all amounts to the same thing, and means that we have been driven out of our house and home, bag and baggage, because a captain wanted that one set of quarters. Call it what one chooses, the experience was not pleasant, and will be long remembered. Being turned out was bad enough in itself, but the manner in which it was done was humiliating in the extreme. We had been in the house only three weeks, and had worked so hard during that time to make it all comfortable Findlay wanted to tear down the canvas partition in the dining room when we left the house, and I was sorry later on that I had not consented to his doing so. One morning at ten o'clock I received a note from Fay, written at the guardhouse, saying that his set of quarters had been selected by a cavalry officer who had just arrived at the post, and that every article of ours must be out of the house that day by one o'clock. Also, that as he was officer of the guard, it would be impossible for him to assist me in the least, except to send some enlisted men to move the things. At first I was dazed and wholly incapable of comprehending the situation. It seemed so preposterous to expect anyone to move everything out of a house in three hours. But as soon as I recovered my senses, I saw at once that not one second of the precious time must be wasted, and that the superintendence of the whole thing had fallen upon me. So I gathered my forces, and the four men started to work in a way that showed they would do everything in their power to help me. All that was possible for us to do, however, was almost to throw things out in the side yard for remember, please, we had only three short hours in which to move everything, and this without warning or preparation of any kind. All things big and small were out by one o'clock, and just in time, too, to avoid a collision with the colored soldiers of the incoming cavalry officer, who commenced taking furniture and boxes in the house at precisely that hour. Of course, there was no hotel or even restaurant for me to go to, and I was too proud and too indignant to beg shelter in the house of a friend. In fact, I felt as if I had no friend. So I sat down on a chair in the yard with the little dog by me, thinking, I remember, that the chair was our own property and no one had a right to object to my being there and I also remember that the whole miserable affair brought to mind most vividly scenes of eviction that had been illustrated in the papers from time to time, when poor women had been evicted for non-payment of rent. Just as I had reached the very lowest depths of misery and woe, Mrs. Vincent appeared, and Fay almost immediately after. We three went to Mrs. Vincent's house for luncheon, and, in fact, I remained there until we came to this house. She had just heard of what had happened and hastened down to me. Captain Vincent said it was entirely the fault of the commanding officer for permitting such a disgraceful order to leave his office, that Captain Park's family could have remained one night longer in tents here, as they had been in camp every night on the road from Fort Sill. There came a ludicrous turn to all this unpleasantness, for, by the ranking out of one junior second lieutenant, six or more captains and first lieutenants had to move. It was great fun the next day to see the moving up and down the officer's line of all sorts of household goods, for it showed that a poor second lieutenant was of some importance after all. But I am getting on too fast. Fay, of course, was entitled to two rooms, some place in the post, but it seems that the only quarters he could take were those occupied by Lieutenant Cole. So Fay decided at once to go into tents himself, in preference to compelling Lieutenant Cole to do so. 
Now it so happened that the inspector general of the department was in the garrison, and as soon as he learned the condition of affairs, he ordered the post quartermaster to double two sets of quarters, that is, make four sets out of two, and designated the quartermaster's own house for one of the two. But Major Knox divided off two rooms that no one could possibly occupy, and in consequence has still all of his large house. But the other large set that was doubled was occupied by a senior captain, who, when his quarters were reduced in size, claimed a new choice, and, so turning another captain out, the ranking out went on down to a second lieutenant. But no one took our old house from Captain Park, much to my disappointment, and he still has it. The house that we are in now is built of cedar logs, and was the commanding officer's house at one time. It has a long hall running through the center, and on the left side Major Hunt and his family have the four rooms, and we have the two on the right. Our kitchen is across the yard, and was a chicken house not so very long ago. It has no floor, of course, so we had loads of dirt dug out and all filled in again with clean white sand, and now, after the log walls have been scraped and whitened, and a number of new shelves put up, it is really quite nice. Our sleeping room has no canvas on the walls inside, and much of the chinking has fallen out, leaving big holes, and I never have a light in that room after dark, fearing that Indians might shoot me through those holes. They are skulking about the post all the time. We have another cook now, a soldier, of course, and one that is rather inexperienced. General Phillips ordered Finley back to the company, saying he was much needed there, but he was company cook just one day when he was transferred to the general's own kitchen. Comment is unnecessary. But it is all for the best, I am sure, for Farrar is very fond of Hal and sees how intelligent he is just as I do. The little dog is chained to a kennel all the time now, and, like his mistress, is trying to become dignified. Faye was made post-adjutant this morning, which we consider rather complimentary, since the post commander is in the cavalry, and there are a number of cavalry lieutenants here. General Dickinson is a polished old gentleman, and his wife a very handsome woman, who looks almost as young as her daughter. Miss Dickinson, the general's older daughter, is very pretty and a fearless rider. In a few days we too are to commence our morning rides. How funny that I should have forgotten to tell you that I have a horse. At least I hope he will look like a horse when he has gained some flesh and lost much long hair. He is an Indian pony of very good size and has a well-shaped head and slender little legs. He has a fox trot, which is wonderfully easy, and which he apparently can keep up indefinitely, and, like all Indian horses, can run like a deer. So, altogether, he will do very well for this place, where rides are necessarily curtailed. I call him Cheyenne, because we bought him of Little Raven, a Cheyenne chief. I shall be so glad when I can ride again as I have missed so much the rides and grand hunts at Fort Lyon. Later, the mail is just in, and letters have come from Fort Lyon telling us of the death of Lieutenant Baldwin. It is dreadful, and seems impossible. They write that he became more and more despondent, until finally it was impossible to rouse him sufficiently to take an interest in his own life. Faye and I have lost a friend, a real, true friend. A brother could not have been kinder, more considerate than he was to both of us, always. How terribly he must have grieved over the ruin of the horse he was so proud of, and loved so well. End of letter. Camp Supply, Indian Territory, September 1872. The heat here is still intense, and it never rains, so everything is parched to a crisp. The river is very low, 
and the water so full of alkali that we are obliged to boil every drop before it is used for drinking or cooking, and even then it is so distasteful that we flavor it with sugar of lemons so we can drink it at all. Fresh lemons are unknown here, of course. The ice is given out, but we manage to cool the water a little by keeping it in bottles and canteens down in the dugout cellar. Miss Dickinson and I continue our daily rides, but go out very early in the morning. We have an orderly now, as General Dickinson considers it unsafe for us to go without an escort since we were chased by an Indian the other day. That morning the little son of General Phillips was with us, and as it was not quite as warm as usual, we decided to canter down the Sunflower Road a little way, a road that runs to the crossing of Wolf Creek through an immense field of wild sunflowers. These sunflowers grow to a tremendous height in this country, so tall that sometimes you cannot see over them, even when on horseback. Just across the creek there is a village of Apache Indians, and as these Indians are known to be hostile, this particular road is considered rather unsafe. But we rode on down a mile or more without seeing a thing, and had just turned our ponies' heads homeward when little Groat, who was back of us, called out that an Indian was coming. That was startling, but upon looking back we saw that he was a long distance away and coming leisurely, so we did not pay much attention to him. But Groat was more watchful and very soon screamed, Mrs. Ray, Mrs. Ray, the Indian is coming fast, he's going to catch us. And then, without wasting time by looking back, we started our ponies with a bound that put them at their best pace, poor little Groat lashing his most unmercifully and crying out every minute, He'll catch us, he'll catch us. That the Indian was on a fleet pony and was gaining upon us was very evident and what might have happened had we not soon reached the sutler's store no one can tell but we did get there just as he caught up with us and as we drew in our panting horses that hideous savage rode up in front of us and circled twice around us his pony going like a whirlwind and in order to keep his balance the indian leaned far over on one side his head close to the pony's neck he said how with a fiendish grin that showed how thoroughly he was enjoying our frightened faces, and then turned his fast little beast back to the sunflower road. Of course, as long as the road to the post was clear, we were in no very great danger, as our ponies were fast. But if that savage could have passed us and gotten in between him and the Apache village, we would have lost our horses, if not our lives, for turning off through the sunflowers would have been an impossibility. The very next morning, I think it was, one of the government mules wandered away, and two of the drivers went in search of it, but not finding it in the post, one of the men suggested that they should go to the river where the post animals are watered. It is a fork of the Canadian River, and is just over a little sand hill, not one quarter of a mile back of the quarters, but not in the direction of the Sunflower Road. The other man, however, said he would not go, that it was not safe and came back to the corral. So the one who proposed going went on alone. Time passed, and the man did not return, and finally a detail was sent out to look him up. They went directly to the river, and there they found him, just on the other side of the hill, dead. He had been shot by some fiendish Indian soon after leaving his companion. The mule has never been found, and is probably in a faraway Indian village, where he brays in vain for the big rations of corn he used to get at the government corral. Last Monday, soon after luncheon, forty or fifty Indians came rushing down the drive in front of the officers' quarters, frightening some of us almost out of our senses. Where they came from no one could tell, for not one sentry had seen them until they were near the post. They rode past the houses like mad creatures and on out to the company gardens where they made their ponies trample and destroy every growing thing. Only a few vegetables will mature in this soil and climate, but melons are often very good, and this season the gardeners had taken much pains with a crop of fine watermelons that were just beginning to ripen. But not one of these was spared. Every one was broken and crushed by the little hoofs of the ponies, 
which seemed to enjoy viciousness of this kind as much as the Indians themselves. A company of infantry was sent at once to the gardens, but it was not quite possible for the men to outrun the ponies. The mischief had been done before they got there, and all they could do was to force them back at the point of the bayonet. Cavalry was ordered out also to drive them away, but none of the troops were allowed to fire upon them, and that the Indians knew very well. It might have brought on an uprising. It seems that the Indians were almost all young bucks out for a frolic, but quite ready, officers say, for any kind of devilment. They rode around the post three or four times at breakneck speed, each circle being larger and taking them further away. At last they all started for the hills and gradually disappeared, all but one a sentinel who could be seen until dark, sitting his pony on the highest hill. I presume there were dozens of Indians on the sand hills around the post, peeking over to see how the fun went on. They seemed to be watching the post every second of the day, ready to pounce upon any unprotected thing that ventures forth, be it man or beast. At almost any time two or three black dots can be seen on the top of the white sand hills, and one wonders how they can lie for hours in the hot, scorching sand with the sun beating down on their heads and backs and all the time their tough little ponies will stand near them down the hill, scarcely moving or making a sound. Some scouts declare that an Indian pony never whinnies or sneezes. But that seems absurd, although some of those little beasts show wonderful intelligence and appear to have been apt pupils in treachery. End of letter. Camp Supply, Indian Territory, October 1872 this place is becoming more dreadful each day, and every one of the awful things I feared might happen here seems to be coming to pass. Night before last the post was actually attacked by Indians. It was about one o'clock when the entire garrison was awakened by rifle shots and cries of, Indians! Indians! There was pandemonium at once. The long roll was beaten on the infantry drums, and boots and saddles sounded by the cavalry bugles, and these are the calls that startle all who hear them, and strike terror in the heart of every army woman. They mean that something is wrong, very wrong, and demand the immediate report for duty at their respective companies of every officer and man in the garrison. Faye jumped into his uniform, and saying a hasty good-bye, ran to his company, as did all the other officers, and very soon we could hear the shouting of orders from every direction. Our house is at the extreme end of the officer's line and very isolated. Therefore Mrs. Hunt and I were left in a most deplorable condition, with three little children, one a mere baby, to take care of. We put them all in one bed and covered them as well as we could without a light, which we did not dare have, of course. Then we saw that all the doors and windows were fastened on both sides. We decided that it would be quite impossible for us to remain shut up inside the house, so we dressed our feet, put on long waterproof coats over our nightgowns as quickly and silently as possible, and then we sat down on the steps of the front door to await we knew not what. I had firm hold of a revolver, and felt exceedingly grateful all the time that I had been taught so carefully how to use it, not that I had any hope of being able to do more with it than kill myself if I fell in the hands of a fiendish Indian. I believe that Mrs. Hunt, however, was almost as much afraid of the pistol as she was of the Indians. Ten minutes after the shots were fired, there was perfect silence throughout the garrison, and we knew absolutely nothing of what was taking place around us. Not one word did we dare even whisper to each other, our only means of communication being through our hands. The night was intensely dark, and the air was close, almost suffocating. In this way we sat for two terrible hours, ever on the alert, ever listening for the stealthy tread of a moccasined foot at the corner of the house, and then, just before dawn, when we were almost exhausted by the great strain on our strength and nerves, our husbands came. They told us that a company of infantry had been quite near us all the time, 
and that a troop of cavalry had been constantly patrolling around the post. I cannot understand how such perfect silence was maintained by the troops, particularly the cavalry. Horses usually manage to sneeze at such times. There is always a sentry at our corner of the garrison, and it was this sentinel who was attacked, and it is the general belief among the officers that the Indians came to this corner, hoping to get the troops concentrated at the beat furthest from the stables, and thus give them a chance to steal some, if not all, of the cavalry horses. But Mr. Redman's strategy is not quite equal to that of the great father's soldiers, or he would have known that troops would be sent at once to protect the horses. There were a great many pony tracks to be seen in the sand the next morning, and there was a mounted sentinel on a hill a mile or so away. It was amusing to watch him through a powerful field glass, and we wished that he could know just how his every movement could be seen. He sat there on his pony for hours, both Indian and horse apparently perfectly motionless. But with his face always turned toward the post, ready to signal to his people the slightest movement of the troops. Faye says that the colored troops were real soldiers that night, alert and plucky. I can readily believe that some of them can be alert, and possibly good soldiers, and that they can be good thieves too. For last Saturday night they stole from us the commissary stores we had expected to last us one week. Everything, in fact, except coffee, sugar, and such things that we kept in the kitchen where it is dry. The commissary is open Saturday mornings only, at which time we are requested to purchase all supplies we will need from there for the following week. And as we have no fresh vegetables whatever, and no meat except beef, we are very dependent upon the canned goods and other things in the commissary. Last Saturday, Mrs. Hunt and I sent over as usual and most of the supplies were put in a little dugout cellar in the yard that we used together, she having one side, I the other. On Sunday morning, Farrar happened to be the first cook to go out for things for breakfast, and he found that the door had been broken open and the shelves as bare as Mother Hubbard's. Everything had been carried off except a few candles on Mrs. Hunt's side and a few cakes of laundry soap on mine. The candles they had no use for, and the thieves were probably of a class that had no use for soap either. Our breakfast that morning was rather light, but as soon as word got abroad of our starving condition, true army hospitality and generosity manifested itself. We were invited out to luncheon and to dinner and to breakfast the next morning. You can see how like one big family a garrison can be, and how in times of trouble we go to each other's assistance. Of course, now and then we have disagreeable persons with us, those who will give you only three hours to move out of your house, or who will order your cook from you. End of letter. End of section three.